Okay, good day. This is pre-calculus. This is going to be our part uh, two of section 4.6 for our second snow day, Monday, uh, January 8th. So let's get right to it and see if we can get this done a little bit quicker than what we did on the last one. All right, so today, going back to learning goals, we're going to be talking about uh, some applications and sketching the graphs of damp trigonometric functions. We'll do one real simple one of that, and then we'll do an application problem, and hopefully we'll finish this up fairly quickly. All right, so the first question that I want to talk about today is from page 312, number 48, asking you to do two things. Now, in the book, the first thing it says is to graph y1 and to graph y2. And it wants you to um, to show that they are the same, and that's a fairly simple, easy uh, process. Hopefully, we're put all able to put um, these things into our graphing calculators and come up with uh, graphs. But it wants you to do it algebraically, and that is something that we are definitely going to spend a lot of time on in the uh, next particular unit. And so we'll start with a very simple one, and we want to show that these two things are equal to each other. So um, if I start off by saying that the cosine of x over the sine of x is equal to the cotangent of x, we know that this thing has to be true because of the reciprocal, actually, I'm sorry, um, from our, uh, our trigonometric identity cheat sheet, we know that the quotient identities, Q-U-O-T-I-E-N-T -E identities, says that cotangent is, in fact, cosine x over sine x. So that's a fairly easy one to do, and it's a good one to get us started with on a bright and early snowy Monday morning. Moving on to the next one, I want to talk a little bit about trig. Uh, damped trig graphs and what that means. And so the way that I look at damped trig graphs is this is the product of two functions. This function right here is just y equals x. And then this function right here is y equals sine x. So I've got two functions. First function, second function. Now, this first function is fairly easy to graph. y equals x. That thing would look like this. Now, i got to get it nice. I'm going to use a dotted line, something simple. It's going to be a nice, simple graph. All right. And so the way that we think about sine x, though, is the values of sine x um, for y2 are going to be between negative 1 less than or equal to y2 less than or equal to positive 1. And so I think of this as percentages. All right, this way I look at it. When it's negative 1, it's negative 100% of this graph. When it is this one, it is positive 100% of this graph. All right, so I have the positive one drawn. Y equals X, this is the positive value. But this negative 100% would be Y equal to negative X. And so if I were to again try and draw a graph that looked like that, I'd have my Y equals negative X. Now, when um, sine of x equals negative 1, it'll be a negative 100% of this line graph. And y, when um, sine x equals positive 1, it'll equal positive of that graph. All right. And we know that sine goes up and down. And so I'm still going to block it off basically the same way that I did the first, did it originally. So I'm going to say that here is my um, pi over 2. Here is pi, here is, <coughs> excuse me, 3 pi over 2, here is 2 pi. All right, so think of it this way. When sine x equals 0, all right, sine of 0 is 0, 0 times 0 is 0, so I have a graph 
there's my first point. All right. Now at pi over two, at pi over two, um, uh, sine is equal to one, and so I get a graph. Let's see here how I want to draw that. It's going to be up to this point here, and then at um, pi, the sine is zero, and so pi times zero would be zero. And then at 3 pi over 2, the sine of x is negative 1. And so I'll get negative 3 pi over 2. And then at 2 pi, I get sine equal to 0 again. So my graph is going to look something like this. The reason that they call it a damped graph is that it takes on the characteristics of that particular graph. And so similarly, at negative uh, pi over 2, I have negative 1. And so here's my negative pi over 2 and my negative pi. And so I'll get a graph that looks, again, similar to this. And you can put it in your graphing calculator to get that. All right. I like that. And then this would be... Uh, uh, negative 3 pi over 2, which would be positive 1, and then this one's negative 2 pi. Let's that graph. All right, my last one. This is page 3, 13, number 66. And it is kind of a long and drawn out one. So I'm going to read it here, and then we'll fill in the blanks, and I'll show you what that picture means. It says, okay, a cross belt connects a 10 centimeter pulley on an electric motor with a 20 centimeter puller pulley on a saw tooth arbor. See the figure. The electric motor runs at 1700 revolutions per minute. All right. All right, so what you got to think here, here is a small electric engine on this small circle here. And there's a belt that connects it to a larger circle over here that's connected to a saw. So this is kind of like a table saw thing. All right, and so this belt goes all the way around both of these two, uh, these two circles. And as this one spins, it turns the saw blade. All right, so part A says... Determine the red part A. I'm going to use the same diagram and I'll just erase here as I go on. Determine the rev revolutions of the big um, circle. All right, so let's fill in a few things. First off, we know that this one, and this is by definition, that. Uh, um, or by the diagram, that this small circle has a radius of 10 centimeters and that this one has a radius of 20 centimeters. <coughs> and so this dotted line here is connected to the centers of both of these. And I know we have to go back to uh, geometry two years ago, but... Um, when a line touches the circle at a point of tangency, which is what we'll have here, you're going to end up with right angles. So I have right angles at all of these places. So we have a bunch of right little triangles. And they call this angle right here theta. And since we have vertical angles and we have similar triangles, we can say that this is also theta. That's theta, and that is theta. All right. So the revolutions per minute in the big circle. Well, the circumference of the small circle is going to be 2 pi times the radius, which is 10. And that, so I have 20 pi centimeters. That is the circumference of the small circle. The circumference of the big circle is going to be 2 pi times 20 or 40 pi centimeters. All right. So if I take this point and I spin it all the way around this particular circle, well, it's going to go, it's going around at 20 pi centimeters and it's moving a piece, a similar distance around here. 
Well, this the bigger uh, the bigger circle is twice as big as the the small circle. So a piece or a point on the belt travels half as far around the big circle as it does around the small circle. Therefore, the um, revolutions per minute of the big is half as much as the small. Thus, we can say that 1700 divided by 2, uh, 16 divided by 2 is 8 with actual one, 850 revolutions per minute. All right, that one was pretty easy, not too hard. Part B, let's erase this so I can use the same diagram. Part B is a little bit more challenging. Part B asks us to say, how does, oh, actually, Part B is easy too. How does crossing the belt affect the saw in relation to the motor? So let's say that this belt goes this way, right? And so this, spinning this belt in uh, a uh, counterclockwise direction, well, the result is that's going to continue there. And then this one would continue back around going this way. So part B, uh, what does crossing the belts do? It reverses the direction of the large circle. All right, and clearly if I ran, and I don't want to do this, but if I ran it in the same direction without, as this one would go, it would go the same direction for both of those. So let's undo that. Get rid of these circles if I can't, all of this. I think that's all my undo is I can do. Let's erase here, erase here, erase there, erase there. All right. Part C. Part C says, let L be the total length of the belt. Write L as a function of phi, and, or theta. I have it written as theta there, so we'll write as a function of theta. Measured in radians. What is the domain of the function? Hint, add the lengths of the straight sections of the belt and the length of the belt around each pulley. Okay, so L equals the uh, two times the length of the belts of the straight sections. That's not right. How about equals two times S T R E I G H T parts plus uh, the part around the small plus the around the big. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, if I call this um, A1, this part A2, right? So if I find this length and I find that length, I can multiply it by two and I'll have the length of both the straight parts. And then we'll go about calculating each of these two parts of the circle. That shouldn't be too bad. We can do that. All right, so let's figure this part out. Well, right here, if I think about it, here is a right triangle. Here is theta. This opposite side of theta is the 20 centimeters. And this piece, since I have a right angle here, this is the hypotenuse. So that piece should be the adjacent side. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, if I go the tangent of theta, I will get the opposite side 20 over A2, right? So A2 should equal, I should be able to just switch these two and say it's 20 over the tangent of theta. That's not too bad, all right? And so a similar, with a similar um, argument, I should be able to say that A1 is equal to 10 over the tangent of theta. So the two straight parts 
SP should equal 20 over tangent theta plus 10 over tangent theta. And since I have common denominators, I can make that 30 over tangent theta. So L equals, let's see here, 2 times 30 over tangent theta. All right, that's good. So I've got the two straight parts. Now I got to figure out this part here. That's going to be my small. And then I need this part right here. That's going to be the big. Okay, well, let's figure that out. First, let's do a little racing so I can use the same picture. And if this is 90 degrees, actually, pi over 2, because they said to do it in radians, all right, and this is theta, then this particular section here has to be pi over 2 minus theta. And this particular section has to be pi over 2 minus theta. Is everybody okay with that? Now, these two together, pi over 2 minus theta plus pi over 2 minus theta would be equal to, let's make sure I'm doing this correctly, um, would be equal to pi minus 2 theta. That seems reasonable. All right. And so if this is pi minus 2 theta, then this section here all the way around would be 2 pi, the, uh, the entire um, central angle measure of a circle is 2 pi radians, minus what we just found there, which would be pi minus 2, two theta. And so when I subtract that, 2 pi minus pi is just pi, and then 2 pi minus negative 2 theta would be plus 2 theta. And so that is this measure right here. And that's not too bad. So finally, <coughs> the length of an arc, if you remember back from earlier, is S. And if you are in radians, that is R theta. So in this case, R theta is pi plus 2 theta, and our r is 20 centimeters. So 20 times pi plus 2 theta. That's our first one. And by a similar argument, we can say that since the radius is 10, we, and again, this would be um, pi over 2 minus theta, and this one would be pi over 2 minus theta. So our, our small our small part would be, so this is for the big one, and then our S for the small one would be, not 20, come on, what can we get with it? Would be 10 times pi plus 2 theta. And so figuring that out, so the small part we figure is going to be 10 times pi plus 2 theta. And then the big part would be 20 times pi plus 2 theta. And since these two are essentially like terms, we can say that L equals, I can go 2 times 30 is 60 over tangent theta plus 10 plus 20 is 30 times pi plus 2 theta. There is our values there. And if I want to say what the domain is, that has to deal with theta, because that's both of these are based on theta. And so we have to deal with what the, the real world in this particular instance. Theta can't be zero, because if theta is zero, um, this thing, these sides will grow, go to nothing. And it, it's, um, it would basically come all the way around and then go straight off to the other side. And that's not. It's not really possible for us to have. So it has to be bigger than zero. And once theta becomes 90 degrees, these would go, these would be straight up and down. And so our circles would actually be overlapping. 
So they have to be at least smaller than pi over 2. That's um, our possibilities. Now, it's going to be even different than that. Um, but as, as far as what you could actually make in, a, in the real world, but as far as what we're concerned for this, that is our going to be our domain. And then our finally, there there's there's two more parts, but one's graphing, and then the other one says use graphing utility to complete the the um, to complete the the table. So they want us to figure out what L is over a given set. So I'm just going to make a, a quick little table here, and I got one, two, three, four, five. Four, five, so I need six here. So let's move this here. And so they want us to calculate, uh, given a theta, they want us to calculate L, and they give us 0.3 radians, 0.6 radians, 0.9 radians, 1.2 radians, and 1.5 radians. So I'm just going to take this equation right here, and I'm going to type it into a graphing calculator that I have. And so y equals, let's see here, I have 60 over tangent theta plus 30 times pi plus 2 theta. And so I'm going to set up my window. I'm going to do my table start. I notice that the difference between each of these is 0.3. 3 plus 0 0.3 is 0.6. Plus 0 0.3 is 0.9. Plus 0.3 is 1.2. Plus 0.3 is 1.5. So I'm going to do. I'm going to have the calculator do it for me. I start at 0 0.3. Change in table 0.3. Go to auto. Hit enter. And do my graph. And so I get 306.5. Two one. These are centimeters. Two seventeen point um, nine five. <coughs> excuse me. One ninety five point eight six. One eighty nine point seven five. And one eighty eight point two five. Now, is are either is any of these reasonable? Well, think of it this way. If I calculated just the circumferences of the circle, all right, this one would be 2 pi times r, all right? So this would be 40 pi, which is 120, and then this one, or 120-ish, all right? Because if I go 40, 40 times pi, three uh, pi is 3.14 times 40, that's going to be 120, and then... Uh, 20 times pi is another 60, so right there is your 180 at least. And so as uh, theta gets bigger, um, these two are going to end, these two circles end up getting a lot closer to each other, and the radius is ten, or the length is going to shorten. And um, I guess we're going to be done. We're going to call it a day for that. Uh, we'll have question, uh, question and answers over anything from 4.6 when we get back to school on Tuesday, which I think shouldn't be a problem. So have a good day.